Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I invite you to please be seated. I was going to begin this morning with a funny joke and punchline, but Reverend Alex took it. <laughs> but I think that's a better thing because the kids also got to hear it. Yes, we are in the fifth and final week of the bread discourse in John's Gospel. And a funny bit I'll improv, improv for you this morning is I'll share a meme that I saw circulating social media among all the priest friends of mine. And it's this picture of this woman celebrating Holy Eucharist, but the altar is piled so high with bags of bread that you can't see her anymore. <laughs> So here we are, our fifth and final week, and throughout these five weeks, this has been a great reflection time for me about the physical substance of bread. It is nourishment for our bodies and this touch point of community and culture for us as it was in Jesus' time as well. All this talk about bread and my memories frequently bring me back to a core memory in March and April of 2020. You know that time when all of our lives were turned upside down and we started to shelter in place for the protection of ourselves and our loved ones and community transmission of COVID-19. And at the time, I was serving at the Bishop's Ranch, which is an Episcopal camp and conference center in Healdsburg, out in wine country. And I was enjoying my time serving as the priest in charge of a Sunday congregation where we met and worshiped and had weekly activities. And I was also the director of a summer camp. And in my first couple of months, I was excitedly getting plans ready in 2019 for summer 2020. <laughs> and of course, all of that, like all of our lives, completely changed. And while I was able to get out in the beautiful countryside for solitary walks and reflection, a lot of my time, regrettably, was spent in my 400 square foot church basement, which was also my apartment. <laughs> And while I tried to busy myself with phone calls to loved ones, playing with my cats, reading books, I'll admit I spent a lot of time on my computer. That was a source of entertainment and community. And it was surprising to me that so many people in forums, in news articles, in Facebook posts, they were talking about bread. Right? They were talking about where to buy bread, where you've seen the loaves uh, on the shelves at what store. People were re resorting to making their own bread for nourishment, but also for hobby and sport. So I saw two kinds of posts most prevalently. I saw, number one, a post bragging about all of those individuals, oh, I've stockpiled my freezer, I bought out all the bread in the store, I'm good, I have all the flour and yeast, and me and my family, we're gonna be fed for months, we're good. But, heartingly, there were more posts that were sharing where someone had recently found a loaf of bread, and where there was still some stock, and the address of the store where you can go find it too. There were friends offering to ship packets of yeast to their loved ones through the mail so that they could make bread. There were others who had a pantry full of flour from 2019 who were ready and willing to share with others. There were hosts and hosts of video tutorials about how you could make sourdough for those folks who didn't have yeast. I, I see a lot of nods, a lot of folks got into sourdough at that time. So th there was this feeling on the one hand of isolation and scarcity and fear, and on the other hand, there was this community coming out of isolation, and there was connection and creativity going on, all from the, the sustenance and function of bread. Now in our fifth and final week of talking about Jesus and John's gospel and bread, Jesus has a lot to say not only about bread, but also about who he is, and life in community when we follow Christ. And the gospel, as you know, starts with these shocking yet powerful words. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. 
On the one hand, there's this encouraging notion that Jesus is with his followers, and he is with his followers, and that his followers are with him. There's this intimate connection. But on the other hand, there's this shocking notion of eating Jesus's physical flesh and drinking his blood. Now, immediately, this idea of eating flesh, cannibalism, almost universally then and now, brings up a forbidden kind of concept. We don't eat human flesh. And drinking blood further insults injury in Jewish law. Even consuming animal blood is forbidden. So this is, this is a really shocking thing for Jesus to say. He goes on to say that this living bread is different. Many of his hearers might have remembered the story of Moses in the wilderness, God's prophet, who brings God's people through the wilderness and God provides manna to sustain them. And that's physical substance that provides nourishment for their bodies so that they can continue on that journey with Moses as the messenger of God. But here Jesus communicates that it's a little bit different, that he is, the bread that he is providing is lasting bread, manna from heaven, and that this bread will sustain everyone an everlasting life. And people are offended, and they're shocked, and at this point probably a lot of people stop listening, and they just can't accept any more. So they they make up their minds about what Jesus is saying. Jesus goes on to say that the words he speaks are of spirit and light. They're of spirit and life. And they, these words and spirit and bread will sustain his followers even through the difficult times. And it is at this moment that many of his followers who give up their life as they know it, who give up other priorities to follow Christ, they just let it go. They let that community, they let that following of Christ go, and they leave Jesus. And Reverend Alex explored all those feelings about what Jesus might be feeling here, and he asks the question. He asks his closest 12 disciples, are you going to leave me too? In this powerful and profound moment, Simon Peter said, to whom can we go, Lord? You have the words of life. We have come to believe and know that you are from the Holy One of God. We have believed and we know. That word believe is really important and it appears all over John's Gospel, more than 80 times. And when it's used, it's used as a verb, an action verb, where people are picking up an activity and they are following Christ in that action of believing. And it's in this formula that John has throughout the gospel. Jesus performs a sign or a miracle. He explains who he is, and through witnessing the power of Christ, people come to know and they come to believe who he is and what he's called to do. This larger story is in the context of two miracles, Jesus walking on water and Jesus feeding the 5,000 which conveys to the hearer that Jesus is from the Holy One of God, sent to spread God's love and God's healing power, to unite individuals out of isolation into community, to nourish them with not only bread, but spirit, and empower and encourage them to go out and share that love with others as they have been nourished and fed. This challenging idea, this this challenge of eating flesh and drinking blood, moreover, is a call into deep and powerful community. In Jesus' final chapters in John, which is called the Farewell Discourse, there's chapters and chapters devoted to Jesus' final moments with his closest followers, where he really conveys what's most important. And in those chapters, unlike the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, there is no instruction or institution of Holy Communion. There's no story of Jesus gathering at table, breaking bread, drinking wine, commanding them to remember him. But moreover, there is abundant teaching on servant leadership, on sacrificial love, and of God in Jesus, Jesus abiding in God, and Jesus calling his followers to abide in Jesus as well. 
so that they can be nourished and empowered to go out and spread the word and love of God. Now, every Sunday and often more, we gather in community and we celebrate Holy Eucharist. We break the bread, we bless the bread, we, we take in physical elements of the bread and wine. And there's a variety of belief in the Episcopal Church about what happens in that moment when we receive the bread and the wine. Some people believe that it is the flesh and blood of Christ. Some believe that it is a symbolic representation of that Last Supper meal. Some people believe that Christ is really present and that's a mystery and holiness that we just live into and we don't quite understand. But whatever we believe, we know that Christ is present when we gather together and we take that bread and the wine. And the invitation is to take in Christ to ourselves and let it change us. Let it change us for the better. Let it transform our hearts and minds so that we can go out and spread the transformative love of Christ. So that we can have the courage and grounding to choose connection over isolation, to choose listening and seeking to understand and seeking the best in people over snap judgments and choosing to fall away from people so that we can choose the power of community over isolation and individualism. And that's a choice and an invitation from Christ that we receive again and again and again. So as we move away from this formal talk in the Gospel of John about bread, I invite you to take it into your heart, and each week as we celebrate communion, to take Christ into your heart, to let it change you, and to go forth 